Do you know what's in your pantry? And more importantly, do you know what should be in your pantry? I'll tell you what, coming up next. Hey, I'm Hope. Welcome to Frugal Friday Tips, where every Friday I give you quick, easy strategies for spending less and saving more. This is the second in our pantry series. Now, if you didn't see part one, I'm going to link it up above and in the description of this video. This video is dedicated to 50 super frugal items that I think everyone should have in their pantry. Now, I do not want you to feel like you need to take notes. And because I wanted to give you a little bit of help, I created a free resource for you. It's a pantry stock up workbook. And basically in this video, I'm going to work my way through the workbook with you and show you how to effectively use it. But all you need to do is to ask and you shall receive. So there will be a link in the description of the video where you can go to request your free pantry stock up workbook. Now, the first page of the workbook, you will see that it says 50 essential items, pantry basics. That's that list of 50 items that I think everyone should have in their pantry. I'm going to work my way through the list with you quickly, pointing out some very specific items I put in there and the real important reasons why I think they actually belong on the list. So let's get started. The first category that we'll be looking at is baking supplies. Whenever you have a need to delve into your pantry, as all of us did in the last 12 months, right? We all found out how essential our pantry really was. You need to make sure that you have some supplies on hand that you can create some baked goods for your family. So flour is actually the first, probably most important thing on that list. Now, the second thing that actually belongs in that area of baking supplies, believe it or not, I think is cornmeal. We often think of cornmeal as being only for cornbread, right? That's the first thing we think of, cornmeal, cornbread. Actually, the reason that I really like cornmeal and I keep it on hand in my pantry at all times is because cornmeal can be for a whole lot more than just cornbread. For instance, if you pour one cup of cornmeal into four cups of boiling water and stir it for just a few minutes, it thickens. And it's a porridge, right? So that is corn porridge that you can serve for breakfast, cornmeal mush. Then if you continue to cook it while stirring it for about 20 more minutes, it continues to thicken and it becomes something that if you pour it into a pan and let it sit overnight in the refrigerator, it hardens. It becomes like almost a rubberized substance. You slice that into slices, stick it in a pan and pan fry it. And you can top that either with a sweet topping like some fruit and also some uh, maple syrup or you can top it with savory toppings. If you're going to serve it for supper, you can serve it with um, some tomatoes, some other sauteed vegetables on top, or you can also top it with some salsa. So it's incredibly, incredibly versatile. And then of course, yes, you can make cornbread out of it. And that is just fine. Now, the other two ingredients that you'll see in front of me what I said belonged in the baking section and were super important were these items, baking soda, and baking powder. Why are those important? Well, of course, those give leavening to bake products. But one of the things that we found out during the pandemic was that people ran out of yeast. Stores couldn't get yeast. It wasn't in stock anymore, and you absolutely could not find it. Well, one of the things that I remembered from my childhood was the fact that you actually don't need yeast in order to bake baked products. You can easily use either baking soda or baking powder. The next thing you're going to see on the list is vinegar. Why is vinegar in the baking goods section of this list? Because you need vinegar to add that to baking soda. Baking soda needs to have a liquid and an acid added to it in order to activate the baking soda. So you have to probably add some vinegar to your baking soda in order to make it bubble up and rise and give those baked goods their height. You do not need to add an acid to the baking powder, however, but you do to the baking soda. So that is why yeast is on there. And cocoa is the final item on that part of the list because, well, chocolate. 
you might be stressed and you might need some cocoa. I'm just saying. Let's move on to the next section. Sweeteners, white sugar. Yes, we do have some white sugar in our home. Now, normally we don't eat sugar at all until it's the weekends, but yes, we do use sugar. And in fact, when I am heavily relying on my pantry, I use white sugar to make my bread products. Um, so I do have some white sugar in there. I do try to make sure that it's cane sugar. I wait till cane sugar goes on sale and then I buy it as much as I can because cane sugar is a non-GMO product. If it doesn't say cane sugar on the label, it's beet sugar. And 98% of the beets grown in the United States are GMO products. So I try really hard not to have sugar in there that is a beet-based sugar. Also, brown sugar, honey, molasses. You might also add some maple syrup to that list. You want to have a variety of sweeteners on hand because they all have different uses. You will find some old-fashioned rolled oats, and you will also find some steel-cut oats in my house at all times. Now, how do we buy it so we don't pay an arm and a leg? We buy it in bulk. I did a video a little earlier in the year that shows you exactly how I buy in bulk. It tells you in detail when, where, and how to buy foods in bulk. And I'll list a link to it up above and in the description of this video so you can take a look at that. Beverages, you gotta have some coffee and some herbal teas. Now, why do I specify that you're gonna want some herbal teas on hand? Herbal teas actually have some medicinal value, so I always keep a variety of herbs and herbal teas on hand, but I also keep some traditional black pico tea on hand as well. Shelf-stable milk. Now, for me, of course, that's gonna be plant-based milk. But if you drink dairy products, then for you, that's going to be some dairy-based milk. But you want to make sure that you have something on hand that is shelf-stable. Let's move on to grains. White rice and brown rice. Why do you want both of them? Well, brown rice actually, as we know, has more nutritional value than white rice. Now, white rice is a perfectly wonderful food product, and it does last longer on the shelf than brown rice does. Brown rice has the whole intact, which means that it is a whole food product, and it does have far more nutritional value for you and a whole lot more fiber than white rice. So generally, I always keep this on my shelf, and I do, I have about four pounds of it on the shelf right now. But I also have several pounds of white rice housed on the next shelf just next to this brown rice. Now, why would I do that? Because white rice is far more shelf stable. And if you are looking at your pantry as something that you're going to perhaps need to delve into if supply lines are disrupted or there's some sort of a power outage or some other natural disaster, then you do want to make sure that you have food products on hand that are going to last a pretty long length of time. So go ahead and put them both on the shelf. Just know you're gonna to need to eat up this brown rice within six months of putting it on the shelf. I also always have a variety of pasta. We love millet. If you've never tried millet, it's a great nutty grain that cooks up in about 20 minutes and you cook it just exactly like you do rice with a two to one ratio of millet to water. We love it. You can eat it for breakfast, lunch, or dinner and treat it just exactly like you would any other grain. And quinoa, of course, there's that grain that nobody knew what it was until about 20 years ago, and everybody called it anything other than its name of quinoa. <laughs> All right, a couple of miscellaneous things. I rarely, and I do mean rarely, cook with oil or even use oil, but I do have some oil on the shelves of my pantry because I figure if something happens and I'm delving into that pantry heavily, it's going to be because there's no food available and I'm going to be baking a whole lot of bread. And I do use oil in my bread when I bake it. So I always have a little bit of olive or canola oil on hand and also some coconut oil. I also recommend having a little bit of broth on hand. For the most part, I make broth, guys. I always make from scraps, from vegetable scraps, I make my own vegetable broth. 
but it doesn't hurt to have some broth, some vegetable broth on hand that is shelf stable in the pantry. The thing I don't like about it usually is the amount of sodium that is involved in that. And also the packaging doesn't make me real happy either. But you know, if you need something and there's no other alternative, it's a good idea to go ahead and have it on hand. Peanut butter, Yes, it's protein and a lot of protein and it helps fill up hungry kids. I don't personally eat peanut butter, but my kids love it. The next area we're going to look at is vegetables. Yes, you want to have a variety of vegetables on hand in your pantry. And you can just look over the list there. You don't need me to show you examples of vegetables <laughs> because you know what they look like. But usually I have tomatoes in all forms on the shelf of my pantry and also um, a healthy amount of corn and beans. Now, in regards to the sodium involved in canned vegetables, the cheapest places that I have found no salt tomatoes. Kroger actually has their own line of no salt tomato products and they're very reasonably priced and you can generally find them on the shelves. And uh, the other place to go is Walmart. Walmart probably has the cheapest prices in town that I have found on no salt tomato products. So if that's an issue for you as it is for us, that's where you wanna go. Now let's see that you can't find any no salt beans or no salt corn. Go ahead and buy the variety that has the salt in it. Give it a good, good, healthy rinse before you serve it, and you're going to rinse off about 60% of that sodium. So if you can't find the no-salt variety, it probably suffices to go ahead and rinse off as much as you possibly can before you serve it. Canned fruits, you want to have some fruit there. And you'll notice that I also have applesauce on the list. Applesauce can be substituted for oil in any baked good. And that's one of the really important reasons why you should have applesauce on your shelf at all times. As you might imagine, I only buy the applesauce that has no sugar added. The only thing on the label of my applesauce should be, well, apples. All right, let's talk beans for a minute, all right? Now, listen, you want to have both canned beans and the dried beans on the shelves of your pantry. Now, here's why. Inevitably, dried beans are less expensive per pound than canned beans. But canned beans, let's face it, they, they just scream convenience in big one-foot-high letters, don't they? <laughs> so I always like to keep them on hand and, and use them when I am kind of in one of those situations where you get 20 minutes to put food on the table and you have absolutely no idea what it is you're going to serve your family. So they're handy for that. But other than that, Usually the dried beans are far, far, far less expensive per pound than the canned beans will ever be. Now, the other thing you want to be aware of is that once again, I mentioned buying in bulk just a little bit earlier, and I'm going to mention it again when we talk about beans. This actually is 12 pounds of beans. It's member's mark, which means, of course, if you know anything about member's mark, it means I got it from Sam's. Uh, it was on clearance at Sam's, and I got this whole bag for $3.41 for 12 pounds of pinto beans. And as you might imagine, I walked out of the store with more than one bag of those pinto beans. The other thing that you can do is buy them in bulk, either online, or you can buy them from a local Amish store. If you have an Amish community around you, it's a great place to buy bulk foods. And one more time, I'm going to link that video that I did on bulk buying of foods in the description of the video and up above. So make sure that you take a look at that if you're interested in how I buy in bulk and save really, really big money on my grocery bill. Now, the final area that we're going to talk about is condiments and sauces. These are an absolutely critical part of your pantry plan. Why? Because condiments and sauces are how you are going to add flavor to your cooking without spending a lot of money. And I'm just going to stack a few of these out here. This is Fresh Finds. This is the name brand from Big Lots. It's their own brand of uh, products. You can find these on the shelves of any Big Lots in your area, and they cost a grand total of one dollar and that's the the whole price um, the regular price usually i buy them when i have a coupon for either 20 or 35 percent off so i actually generally pay less than a dollar now spices don't go bad 
they don't like go rancid. What spices do is they lose their potency over time. So is there such a thing as buying too many spices? Yeah, I would say there probably is at some point, but you never have to feel like you need to throw spices out, let's say, because you've had them on your shelf for more than 12 months. You may just have to use a little bit more of that spice in what you are making in order to get the flavor. But to my knowledge, I've never ever read anywhere in my research that spices actually go bad. It's a great bang for your buck, even though sometimes you feel like you're paying a little bit up front in order to get these spices, but they add incredible flavor and yet a little bit goes a whole long way. Here are a couple of other things that you can use that will add a lot of flavor to your cooking with not a lot of money. And that is bottles of either lemon juice or lime juice. Uh, this bottle happened to come, I believe this came from Dollar Tree. Um, but you can also get these from Aldi's. You can get lemon juice and lime juice from Aldi. Uh, this adds amazing flavor. And not only that, um, if you drink lemon juice on a regular basis, it actually balances your pH. So it's super, super healthy for you and it's good for you. So it's something that you always wanna think about keeping on the shelves of your pantry. These are the items that are gonna add a whole lot of flavor and what I call zing to your cooking without spending a lot of time or a lot of money. Now, if you're looking at everything in this video and we've worked our way through the whole list now, and you're thinking, yeah, but how do I know what herbs and spices would be really good to have on my pantry shelves? I have got you covered. Because if you look at page three of your workbook, you're going to see that I created, yes, another checklist. And this is all the herbs and spices that I personally keep on my pantry shelves at all times. And you are welcome to use this list as well when you are stocking up your own pantry. Now, here's another question. What if you work your way through this pantry basics list and you think, holy cow, there's some stuff on there that I don't actually have. Well, that is why I created this page of the workbook for you. This is a pantry stock up list. This is your worksheet for you to use. When you're going through your own pantry and you're seeing, gosh, there are some things that I need to stock up on, that's what this is for. You're gonna write the item here, the quantity and the package size that you wanna make sure and then you can use it as a little checkoff list. And as you fill in those bare spaces in your pantry, then you can check it off and know that you have a pantry that is ready to go. My goal is always to have a pantry that is full enough that I could go 30 days at any one time without stepping foot outside of my door if I don't want to or need to and head to the grocery store. So that sort of gives you an, an idea of how um, emergency ready we consider our pantry to, we want it to be. Now you might be concerned about one more area and that is what if you don't have a whole lot of storage space? I'm actually gonna cover that next week in the final video in this pantry stock up series. I'm going to give you some great ideas about where you can actually stash some pantry goods if you live in a small space or a small home. And then, I am gonna show you exactly how to use your pantry to put together flavorful foods for your family that won't leave them bored and thinking, well, this came from the pantry. I actually have a four-step process that I go through in order to look at what's in my pantry and create meals from the pantry. And that will be covered next week on the program. Hey, don't forget everybody that you need to go ahead and head on over to the description of the video and request your copy of the Pantry Stock Up Workbook. And I will see you all next week for the third and final installment of the Pantry Stock Up series. Join me then for the next Frugal Friday Tips. That's our furnace, it works good. Shoot, it just started. Yeah, it did. It's okay. Are you sure? Yeah, we, we own a Literally, furnace. Literally, it hasn't been on the whole time. It heats the house. What should we do? It's cold. Um, should we wait for it to go off? I could bring the mic closer. Are you just gonna talk? Let me see how much closer I can bring it. Mm -hmm. Not much. If I dressed that up and made it look like a fixture, I could bring it down. <laughs> I could, I could put something on it. Like a... I'm just gonna talk louder, it'll be fine. Okay. 
Many people have <laughs> <laughs> And she worked in broadcasting. <laughs> <laughs>